But as I gain information, I can gain information as I move up. And yes, there's going to be several con uh, concrete examples. I was just trying to give the sketch of the general framework. And then we can start playing around with uh, just using this for... Um, I'm choosing uh, B equals AC because I want A to be below um, B. Oh, did I? I'm sorry. Uh, I've been streaming on my end. I couldn't tell. So I'm not sure what, what uh, was dropped when I disconnected if, if there was a problem. Um, so I want, yeah, I want A, a to be below uh, because we're doing joins, so the joins move up the lattice. So, um, do you know what the last thing that was shown before I s apparently lost connection? Or there was a hiccup or something? All right, well, then I will proceed as if there wasn't a hiccup, and we'll see if uh, if we can figure it out from there. Um, huh. Okay, so what do we have? We have these monotone functions between join semi-lattices, and then what I'm going to be looking for is a set of conditions upon which what we could do is say if I... Whenever I gain information on one of my nodes, if um, all of the propagators out of that node eventually, quote unquote, fire, transferring that information to other cells, and then that causes other information to potentially be gained or for me to stay stuck because like it doesn't improve, um, if it doesn't uh, gain any information, we don't cause the propagators to fire. The idea here is that under certain conditions, which I'll try and explain, um, the um, propagator network under any scheduling strategy that you can pick for the order in which you choose to evaluate these arrows um, will terminate and yield a deterministic finite answer, a uh, deterministic answer. So the idea here is that um, I want a notion of coherent um, uh, parallelism. We get, we get um, parallel evaluation because you can basically evaluate these rules in any order um, as many of them at a time as you want, and it doesn't matter the order in which you evaluate, you're still going to yield the same answer as long as our network has certain nice properties. So that's sort of the um, the end goal here. All right, let's move back to the coding and drawing version of the screen. I've got this stuff up to the side. Maybe we can write some code that tries to express this, or uh, confluent is probably the right term. Um, so data flow and abstract interpretation. I think the, uh, there's a connection between this and, um, like the way finite domain solvers work. One of them is AC3. I'm not quite catching what you mean by data flow. So like these are not like, it's not like, um, like FRP. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what you mean below. Um, in, in some ways we can start tying this to like a lot of more like, oh, the data flow analysis and the control flow graph. Okay. Um, initialize nodes while the sets are still changing recompute the sets. The thing is, is that, uh, do we know that to be useful, the iterative approach should reach a fixed point. Yes. This is the same right idea. Partial order with finite height. This is, complies with something else that I'm using here. So yes, this is probably an example of a propagator problem rather than, um, so yes. Um, so I'll, uh, try and address some of this as we go. So one of the examples of a um, calculation that I might want to do here is, um, let's see here. 
what we could do is we could start with any piece of information or, or any data type and build a very simple lattice. We already kind of built an example of it with this Boolean lattice that we started with here. All right, I'm going to say the word lattice, but every time I say the word lattice, substitute join semi-lattice in your head. Um, because that's what I mean. Again, so I'm going to be drawing join semi-lattices probably without their tops. So I always assume that there's a node at the top of the join semi-lattice. So we could take any join semi-lattice and start with, or any type you want, like Booleans, and put a bottom underneath it and say, I don't know what the value is, kind of like domain theory. Join semi lettuce. Uh, yeah, team appended with false will be contribution contradiction. We're always joining up. A or B is going to be the least upper bound. So contradiction will be when you do if you tell me something is if bottom here is that I don't know any information about a thing. Um, if you tell me then that it's true, then I'll move up to true. If you tell me then that it's also false, then I'll reach the contradiction state. Or like I might, and this might be infinitely wide, right? Like I might have, you know, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, da, 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 da. So you could tell me that the answer is minus one from when I join that with my existing bottom, I'll move up to minus one. You could tell me that it is, and yes, it's, Bit of a fox face. Here we've gained a lot of whiskers. Um, uh, the moment you tell me that the the answer is two different things, then I'll blow up the world in contradiction. So this is actually pretty similar to the notion of an IVAR, which is like a variable that can be set exactly once. Um, so in Lindsay Cooper's work on LVARs, in um, her little uh, language Elvish, where she talks about the par monad, um, she works with um, a form of IVAR that you're allowed to assign multiple times so long as you always assign it the same value. And yeah, Sudoku is a kind of problem that you could, you could apply this to. Um, finite domain solvers kind of, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they wind up being an instance of this. So we'll get there in a minute. Um, I don't know how much actual code we're going to produce today. Um, mainly cause I just don't know how long my throat's going to hold out. But if nothing else, we can get the problem phrased and maybe we can pick it up again if folks are interested in carrying on. Um, so what we can do is if you give me in Haskell, all functions are monotone functions as well. Um, right. If I gain information about the inputs, if my inputs become more defined then my outputs can only become more defined. Unless you start playing around with IO, you have no ability to catch exceptions and to detect bottoms in any other sort of meaningful way. So all functions that don't end in IO are monotone functions in the same manner. Um, not every monotone function can be expressed in Haskell directly, um, but all functions in Haskell are monotone functions. And so what we could do is we could lift any Haskell function and make it into a propagator. So like if I, if I had some input and I wanted to spit out an output, like if I, the moment I learn that this input goes from say, you know, it's zero one, you know, it's, I know that it's exactly one, I can have an even propagator that tells me is the result true or false? And it'll propagate the value from one here and tell me false because um, well, one is not even. Um, and so what we would do is if we, when we started at bottom, there was no information being transferred by this. So what do we know? That we know that even of bottom is bottom. We know that even of one is false, etc. So as we gain information in the input, we only gain information in the output. So the first example is that we can lift an arbitrary Haskell function into a propagator network. Uh, propagator like const is okay. 
it's always yielding an answer. As I gain information about the input, I do not move on the output. I never go down. So, like, basically all we want is, like, if A is less than or equal to B, then F of A is less than or equal to F of B. Under this ordering where less than or equal to is, is below in this diagram. So, um, and other examples of types of propagators that we could use is that I could choose my join semi-lattice to be, it's not if, um, A ma pen B if, I don't understand your, um, a mapend B is not necessarily Boolean, right? Because A mapend B is, is in any join semi-lattice. Um, so, sorry, Manip, I your comment doesn't even type check. Um, what I want is that if... Um, C equals A map N B implies that F of C equals, that sounds right. There should be a distributive law there, yes. That is correct. You're going to respect the lattice structure as you map it over. So it will be a lattice homomorphism. I do have a Comet University shirt my mom got me. Um, oh, and speaking of shirts, I'm wearing my uh, shiny new, let's see if I can frame myself right so that this thing doesn't look weird. Oh wow, the color went really weird on that. Um, so I tweeted out a picture of a or a link to a shirt. No, it, the, the, the bottom of it says taken by, uh, uh, by Haskell. It was a, uh, and I'm not, my, my wife is in the other room. I bought the shirt to teaser and I have turned into a ghost apparently because there we go. Um, the, I, I let it auto adjust the color a bit because before it was, um, I wound up really, really red in an early stream. <laughs> and it takes a little while for it to get back to normal. Okay. Um, so what do we have? We have this notion that we can deal with very simple monotone functions of this sort. Another example of an ordering would be, or another uh, example of a lattice would be that we can talk about um, intervals of the reals or of the rationals. It doesn't really matter if they're real or rationals. Um, same thing of what kind of lies. Um, so what we'll do is here, um, we'll just, let's deal with like closed, yeah, closed intervals of the rationals. Um, A is, uh, we'll deal with intervals from A to B of, you know, a closed form. And the join of them will be, you know, like, let's say this is uh, zero to two, and this is from one to three. They'll join and give me um, three to one to two. So we'll just intersect intervals. And at the very top of my lattice, we'll have singleton points. Say way up here. And then... Well, at the very, very top, we have the empty interval. And down at the bottom, we have sort of minus infinity to infinity, which I guess should be drawn that way. So down at the bottom of our lattice, we have the open interval from minus infinity to infinity. Up at the very top of our lattice, we have the empty interval, which is our contradiction node that there is no possible choice of value. Um, 
And here, this is the first example of a, a joint semi lattice that is infinitely tall. Um, and like in technical Haas diagram terms, like while there's a while this joined with this is this, um, you, we shouldn't be drawing this edge because there's like an infinite number of things between there. Because like when you draw a Haas diagram, you only draw the edges where there doesn't exist anything in the middle. Um, but nevertheless, the join of this and this is this. Okay, so we can build intervals where we've ordered them by how much we know, how tight the interval, like um, A is less than or equal to B if A is a subinterval. I did it over the integers. You could pick this to be 2.2 .2 or something like that. There. Um, <clears throat> so this lattice is interesting in the sense that it has infinite height. So, um, someone was exhorting me the other day to start providing some negative examples. So I'm going to use this as a bit of a negative example for some of the things I want to do. Um, So in general, what I'm going to say is the first sufficient condition that we can care about for propagators will be that if my lattices have finite height, or rather, I don't necessarily care that they have, well, I guess that would imply finite height. If there's an, what I'll call an ascending chain condition, which is very similar to a lot of stuff that we want to put on DCPOs, etc. Uh, the intervals here are contiguous, yes. The, this was, I just did closed intervals of reals because they had nice properties. Um, uh, in particular that I have tops that are right. I have, I have maximal elements that are below this top node. Um, so the, the thing that I'm kind of looking for is this notion of an ascending chain condition, which means that if you have any path that kind of goes upward through my joint semi lattice, it eventually hits a, a fixed point. You can't go any higher. Um, in this case that we have the top of the, we have the contradiction node at the top of our semi lattice and that the paths to get to contradiction are of finite length. Um, um, and so if we had this condition, then we can go back to our original kind of problem of having any network, so any graph or hypergraph here, because we can have edges that have more than one input. And as long as the lattices that we have satisfy this ascending chain condition, then it doesn't matter the order in which we choose to propagate information. The moment, as long as I have a uh, joint semi lattice where I can detect increase in information, all I have to do is um, when I gain information, push the information over into push the information through the propagators into the into all of the nodes that have output edges from my propagator cell and iterate this thing until it stops. And it will stop because every single one of these things can only climb so high before it hits a fixed point. So eventually everybody is fully saturated with information. So even in the presence of cycles, um, as long as we have an ascending chain condition, this will terminate and yield a deterministic answer. And you can show the determinism from all of the nice idempotence laws and whatnot that we have here. All right, so that's the general idea. Um, so our first two examples were that we had um, this very simple like information ordering where I just knew nothing or I move up to knowing exactly the value, sort of the least possible uh, interesting. Well, this is not quite the the dumbest possible um, join semi lattice. We could have one that goes from bottom straight up to contradiction. We have like a flag that says, "Have I blown up the world yet?" Um, so this is like the the simplest lattice that we could have that fits our our model. Um, from there, we can move to this sort of Ivar or promise. model um, 
And then our next example here was this, all of the um, real numbers or intervals of real numbers. Hello, Argus. Welcome to the stream. Um, okay, so now we have like two examples. <laughs> um, another example would be that we could talk about sets ordered by um, where we union or sets where we intersect. Sets where we do unions um, will have finite height, will have an ascending chain condition if um, if like the domain that over which your set ranges is finite, right? Then the, the, you can just look at the power set of that set and however big that is, is how many, it's how long a chain could possibly be. Um, because you can only gain information as you go up um, and you gain by gaining elements in the set. Um, if you have a, if you have like sets of integers, well then that's potentially infinitely high because the power set of the integers is infinitely big. So we do not have an ascending chain condition, but if you had power sets of, um, if you had sets of Booleans or something like that, then it'll top out pretty quick. Intersection on the other hand, even if the set is um, infinitely large. Um, so what we did was we defined what the monoid was um, or what the join semi lattice was that we're working with. So when we were first doing sets, the, the first version of the sets was with union. So we couldn't gain information by losing set elements because nothing that we can do that unions two sets together is going to cause us to lose elements. Um, the next version would be sets with intersection. So um, kind of the classical example would be, let's do like a set of three elements. Start with the empty set. Um, set of one element, or the set of one, the set of two, three, um, and then these together form one, three, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, let me get a little cube. Um, and so this is a um, set where we're merging by union. And if we flip them over, we're merging by intersection. So this acts as another um, join semi lattice. Again, the intersection version of this is very well behaved in that it um, definitely satisfies my ascending chain condition um, because as you intersect, you, you start with a set with, uh, assuming you start with fat sets that only have finite numbers of elements. So, um, so if you have sets that act that have finite numbers of elements, then you'll always satisfy the ascending chain condition because you, you'll at most lose, all, you'll, you can um, at most stay where you are or lose elements as you, um, uh, as you do joints. Okay. Um, so an example of something that is a little more interesting here, um, using the sort of union model, um, we could have tables with joins. So this starts to bring us to one of our first examples, and this is one of my favorite ones, which is data log. So in data log, uh, hey Jason. Um, in data log, what you'll have is you'll have predicates like, um, let me just move back to the code screen because this is code-ish. Here we'll have things like, um, Ancestor A B given and uh, Ancestor A 
There we go. And I think in the actual notation, you'd need the periods or something there. There we go. And now we might have something like, I know that Bob is the parent, is the parent of Nancy and parent Dave, Bob. And then we'd ask questions like, is go find me all of the ancestors of, or, um, or all the things for which Bob is an ancestor. You'd ask usually of that form. And it would pop back with ancestor, Bob, Nancy, and then because there's no other relationship, maybe I have parent, Nancy, Drew, and so it would say, leave me at the prompt here, uh, ancestor, Bob, Drew. So this would be a typical data log program, and this would be kind of a query against a data log program, spitting out all of these facts. Um, it's, it's so uh, data log rules are read from right to left. This funny arrow is is like given these these conditions, this thing on the left hand side follows. A slightly more natural notation might be to do something like this. What's the difference between data log and prolog? So um, prolog is done in a top down search fashion, uh, data log is built bottom up. The other difference, like that doesn't mean much uh, to you at this point, but the, the other difference is because data log is sort of built as like, it's almost like there's an ancestor table and a parent table. And this is saying, please do the join of the ancestor table with the ancestor table, and then write the results into the ancestor table. Um, and so what happens is prolog is typically not tabulated. There's some, I believe SWI prolog has some stuff for a um, extended uh, algorithm uh, for for prolog where some of your predicates can be tabulated in this fashion. But in general, prolog does not like memoize intermediate like relation results. Um, the other thing is is that data log has a much more restricted syntax, which means that I can't have I can't talk about foo of bar of baz of a is not a thing I can talk about. Like the only ever, you only ever have these kind of flat, I believe, atoms. And so, yeah, data log is not Turing complete. Um, you can basically view it as a fancier SQL. Um, if you're familiar at all with common table expressions in SQL 99, uh, the, the existence of common table expressions was because the SQL folks got jealous of a lot of the things that you can start talking about in data log that you can't talk about nicely in SQL or you couldn't before they got around to extending the language. Um, and so they, they, they basically went and said, Hey, let's grab a handful of use cases out of the data log literature and just say that that's enough. And really the common table expression is really just them. Like, I don't know. It, 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 it's, it's like, let's, let's, let's try and attack a very general problem with a handful of specific examples. It's a mess. Um, so, I mean, under, under the hood, what you could view this is, is the parent um, relation here is a set of rows. Um, and the ancestor relation here is another set of rows. And then the joins here are going to be creating new sets that we're going to merge into the ancestor table. I will, I will leave the um, set of things that it sounds like something that Scala will do uh, just simply uncommented because, well, I may agree. But um, So this is the idea of data log. In general, because there's no way to create new names that are going to be bound, like if you think about it, you could view the set of Bob, Dave, and Nancy as the set of all possible names. Oh, and Drew. Um, in the end, at most, all names could make it their way into all positions because there's nothing that ever creates a new name. There's no like Bob plus one or suck Bob or something like, you know, there's no successor to Bob function that you can use that creates new names in different positions. So eventually, at most, everything could be in every position and then you're done. Uh, 
Um, how well does data log work compared to SQL for data databases? It turns out there's actually some places, some spaces where data log um, really, really shines. Um, there's a project called BDD BDDB, which is just fun to say, uh, the BDD based deductive database. And it was used a lot for um, points to analysis and stuff in um, uh, when reasoning about programming language theory. Because like if you typically if you're if you're trying to figure out like aliasing if if a could if if this value could possibly point to that value um, in some kind of abstract interpretation, what you'll typically have is a huge pile of rules about like um, how every combinator in your language adjusts the points to information and um you want to iterate this out to a fixed point and before you finish um and these kind of analyses tend to be like heavily recursive between different kinds of rules that are all together and need to need to cooperate in order to get your result and so building those things out of data log predicates turns out to be pretty productive um, so, uh, I can't say that this is necessarily the state of the art. The, there was a, um, oh, let's see if I dupe screaming fast points to analysis, uh, screaming declarative pointer analysis. There it is. So let me first of all, dump the link to BDD, BDDB. That's BDD, BDDB. Um, screaming fast declarative point pointer analysis should be Martin Bravenbauer. Yep. There we go. Um, so this talks about doing it through a more traditional SQL engine than, um, BDD, BDD, B, and they make a case that using, um, more intelligent, uh, field ordering and using more traditional SQL like techniques, they can actually outperform the BDD BDDB approach for points to analysis. Um, uh, the BDD BDDB benefit has the, um, uh, or the benefit of BDD BDDB in general is that it doesn't necessarily have to pay row for row for every join. So BDDs can be more efficient when doing joins than any SQL engine can be. Um, the question is whether or not your data tends to have enough structure to exploit that. Um, and the other thing is, is that SQL um, can do all sorts of things like um, uh, like you can have more interesting key structure. Here, the only thing you have are like you can only do natural joins or uh, you can only do joins that, uh, how to put this? You can't have any functional dependencies in your relations here. Well, there's a difference between BDD and BDD, BDDB. BDD, BDDB is a thing that is built with BDDs. Um, so one of, one of the projects that I had fairly recently was trying to build a little BDD engine in Haskell. Um, we haven't really talked about what BDDs are. Um, that's a topic we'll throw on a, um, on a straw poll for another day, I think. All right. Um, so where were we? We were talking about uh, data log as a propagator problem. We can basically view an empty table as the bottom of our um, join semi-lattice. Uh, uh, Passport two. what we're doing right now is we're talking about a general framework for something called propagators. Um, there's a paper called Art of the Propagator from Alexi Bredoul in... 2009 and one of the examples of a propagator problem it turns out to be data log so we're using data log as an example of a uh, propagator network
So in general, what we have is a bunch of, we have some form of join semi lattice. Those are the things that live in our nodes and we have monotone functions between those join semi lattices. So as you gain, as you move upward in the join semi lattice, you can only move upward in the results. Well, you, you, you can't move downward anyways. You can stay where you are. So, um, so data log turns out to be one of the example, one of the first examples of a place that I might want to borrow an interesting um, property of like how, how data log problems are solved in general. Um, so in general, what we do is we don't uh, just like, let's say that, let's look at this uh, example here and consider what would happen if the parent table had like a million entries in it or something like that. Um, then we're gonna dump all the parents into the ancestor table. And here what we're doing is we're doing a full join of the ancestor table against the full join of the ancestor table. And then we're iterating that out until we finish like filling in the ancestor table. Now these rules can be written in any order. They like stay active. So like if I add another record to the ancestor table here, let's say I have a number of these rules, um, then what's going to happen is we're still going to uh, uh, fire this rule over and over again. So as, as we gained more information about my ancestor set, then we're going to have to like keep firing this thing over and over and over again. And if we were to do this with naive evaluation, we're going to um, suffer a great deal performance-wise. So the next step here is to move to something uh, called semi-naive evaluation of data log. And the idea here is that what we should do is kind of keep track of what was the change um, since the last time we um, read into our ancestor table. So like instead of like saying, you know, ancestor, AC, I'm going to use single character definitions, comes from ancestor AB, ancestor BC, and ancestor AB comes from parent AB. Let's first do a let's first do a thing where we can look at this and say, if I were to sort these, like we said before, that it didn't matter the order in which we evaluated our propagator network. So let's let's try and find a good order. Um, if we were to topologically sort this, what what could we do? Well, we could give these things. We could number the rules. And, and in general, if you have like a, we have a, what do we have? We have rule one and rule two. We have ancestor and parent or something like that. And so we know that in rule two, parent feeds into it and then ancestor comes out of it. And then in rule one, ancestor feeds into it and ancestor comes out of it. So we were to like order these rules topologically. Uh, two happens before one. And then once you're done with rule two, because it's not contained in a strongly connected component with rule one, you're done. Like rule two doesn't fire again. It will never, like, the, the, nothing here causes me to gain information about parents after this fact. So rule two has nothing more to say. So I can just finish evaluating rule two, and then I can iterate rule one. So we've done a bit of topological sorting on our rules. Um, and then the, the next observation is, is that in general, it's not worth joining the entire ancestor table against the entire ancestor table because it's only the stuff that's changed since the last time we fired this rule that is interesting. So what we re really want to say is like, I want to compute, I want to dump into my ancestor table, ancestor AC, the result of joining the delta from my ancestor from A to B with the ancestor table from B to C. And the delta, and uh, I need to join my whole ancestor table from A to B with the delta of my ancestor table from B to C. And I have a delta in my ancestor table of um, AB joined against delta in my ancestor table from B to C. There. So the, like basically what we want to do is like we want to join three different ways. So you've given me a small change set. And the small change set is the thing that I want to do the join with. 
So the idea here is that if I told you one new parent, the one new parent would then propagate through rule two into, into the ancestor table, giving me a small delta. And then given this small delta, um, what I'll do is I will, um, I will join the small delta against the entire table a couple of different ways. And then I will uh, just join the delta against itself. Uh, BPAP, I think we do have mods. Um, nothing else. Usually, uh, I guess uh, Brian McKenna and a couple other folks who usually mod are not here yet. We've made a few mods. <clears throat> um, so that's the that's the general idea. Is that what we'll do is we'll like try and compute, like you know, delta sub n sub n plus one or something like that, would be based on the previous delta. And then what we'll do is we'll say that a is the like if we were to glue all the all the mods up to that point together. I should move that out of the way. So that's the that's the general idea of um, semi naive evaluation of data log is that we first topologically sort all of our rules, and then what we do is we apply these deltas. So what we could do is we could try and look for this in a more general setting. We could go back to our world of like we had, we we kind of got lost in the weeds of data log for a bit. Let's kind of pull back out of that and see what we could talk about in like coding terms. Here what we have is we have like a semi-lattice. What I'm really interested in is sort of like, give me a description of the deltas. Like if I go to the sort of coding and drawing screen here. Like if you come from here and you go to here, I'm not interested in telling you everything that is in here and or everything that is in, I'm not interested in telling you everything that is in here or everything that is in some element that I joined with you to get here. What I'm interested in is a description of this path. This path might be, I only added one or two elements. Um, and so that could be much smaller than um, a snow jerk has been pretty well behaved here. I have I have no objections to him other than not being snow. Um, you can't set. Uh, Um, flare here, so I can't set snow jerk. It's not snowman here. Um, so what do we have? So what we what we've managed to find is that like what we want is some kind of delta, some sort of. Um, in general, what I like before, like last time when we were talking about uh, semi direct products, we talked about monoids acting on monoids for a while. Um, what I want is like a commutative monoid that acts on my semi-lattice, my set here, um, and then to use that to represent the change. Um, and so that was that's the major uh, uh, things that we've taken away from um, the world of data log. So, um, data log life lessons here, I guess. Um, we don't need an ascending chain condition. Other conditions may apply. Like in our case here, the set of names was finite. So the starting seed doesn't, um, was enough to determine that, like, everything that we could gain from pushing that into every position in every relation. 
was of um, uh, sufficient to meet our, our needs. So before what we were doing is we were doing, uh, so uh, naive propagation had the, as long as every um, semi-lattice satisfies an ascending chain condition, which is equivalent to saying it has finite height, every chain upward through the join semi-lattice eventually stops. Um, our propagator network terminates with a deterministic solution. Um, so data log taught us that we don't need an ascending chain condition. Other conditions could apply. It taught us that uh, topological sorting may let us fire less often or do less work when we fire. Um, and we also learned that um, having an efficient delta representation can drastically reduce costs. And like, why, why would you see that? Because if, the, if uh, like, let's say we had a million entries in our ancestor table and we added one parent, then we're going to push in one thing here. We're not going to be joining a million things against a million things and then hoping that we get the right result. Uh, or we're gonna get the right result, but hoping that we can do that fast. Uh, what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to do the join of a million things against one thing, and then uh, one, a million things against one thing again, and then one thing against one thing, which is much cheaper than doing a million against a million. So this was the main thing that we learned from data log. Um, so let's move on to other domains. Um, so we had uh, the notion of intervals. So this deltaification doesn't really have a name in literature. Like the way that I could view it is we could build a, um, uh, like this is like all, all literature on this is me rambling on about the topic. Um, so what I'm looking for is like a commutative monoid that acts on my uh, state. And we can eventually get rid of the fact that this is a join semi-lattice. Uh, we could just have a partial order that is being acted upon by a commutative semi-group. Um, you can actually find some references to that concept in literature. Um, the... Uh, Closest thing that I can come up with is like if you start talking about CRDTs, which are uh, commutative or convergent replicated data types, uh, the C is ambiguous. Um, there's CMRDTs and CVRDTs. Uh, convergent replicated data types are where what you have is some join semi lattice. And what you're going to do is you're going to distribute that over a network. Um, and then what you do is when, like, this is a, a strong eventual consistency framework. So whenever you have two, like, if you, if you have a network, the state of what you know about the system is it, 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 each node is represented as a, um, a giant semi lattice. And when, whenever you communicate with another node, you send it your value and it sends you its. And then, uh, the idea is that you then just join those two, um, semi lattice states together and, um, you now have a um, a new state, and so immediately after one message, you're in the you're in a consistent state. So um, the there's the the whole cap theorem that says like uh, consistency, availability, partition tolerance. Pick two, but you always have to pick p. Um, so it's really not the, the cap theorem is kind of really horribly stated. Um, and then like once you start picking availability or consistency, like if you pick availability, then you lose consistency. Um, you can't have all two. You can't have all three. Um, so the closest you can get is to like have eventual consistency, which is like we will converge to the same state eventually with probability one or strong eventual consistency, which is that after one message is exchanged, we're, we're exactly in the same state. Um, it's sort of the 
nicest form of partition tolerance you can have and still have full availability. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff on uh, how to do this through these CRDTs. And so the one I've just described is uh, CVRDTs. And so why, why, why am I rambling on about CRDTs right now? Well, um, because Snowdrick just asked me, um, where is this like notion of a, a small change in literature? Well, in CMRDTs, we get something very similar to this. So, so convergent replicated data types say that my state is a join semi-lattice and that what I'm going to do is um, merge states. Con uh, commutative replicated data types say that what I have is I'm going to receive a series of commands and what I'll do is I'll ensure delivery to make sure that the commands don't get delivered multiple times. And each one of those commands, uh, those, those commute with each other. So if I Google CRDTs here, we should find the um, Wikipedia page on the topic, conflict-free replicated data types. Mark Shapiro, blah, 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 all sorts of fancy names. So community, so uh, state-based CRDTs, you send your full state. So you need commutativity, associativity, and idempotence. This is the join semi-lattice. Um, whereas a CMRDT, um, we only send what, what the change is. But then you need to know that, you need to know delivery has occurred and you need to know that delivery only occurs once because these don't have idempotence. Um, if you had a way to name all of the nodes or something like that, then you could like that are that are participating and tossing around state. Then what you do is you can build a little vector clock of state uh, of or you can if you can if you can name the messages, you can then like put those into a set of messages and you can do all of this using the you, there's 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 mechanisms to convert between CMRDTs and CVRDTs. They're not um, small in the amount of space they take. So each one of these is sort of sufficient for tackling the problem of uh, conflict-free replicated data types. Okay, so why, why, did, I, why did I care about this? So uh, CMRDTs, the messages can be much, much smaller than the entire state of my machine. So if I, ha if I can just like guarantee the delivery of, of, the, of the messages you haven't seen, then we can we can get back up to speed uh, much faster than me possibly sending you my entire state. And yeah, Google Docs um, used to be built on something called Woot, um, or rather, is based on, on some of the stuff that they did on Google Wave that went nowhere, um, and um, Woot and operational transform and all this kind of stuff. There's a there's a whole space of interesting things here. Um, so counters are an example of something where, um, a CMRDT generally works better than a CVRDT because like a, a CMRDT, like if, as long as I have like bump the counter by one, that's not idempotent, but it can be represented as a single state. Um, on the other hand, uh, a CVRDT for a counter can like, you have to keep track of everybody's count or something like that. And then you take the maximum of all the counts. So this is a join semi-lattice that looks like, you know, bottom or, or zero, one, two, three. So as a join semi-lattice, all I can do is I can take the max of a bunch of values from different people. Um, and we've, we've, in some sense, like if we're looking here at the CRDT literature, you're going to find a lot of the propagators that we've been talking about so far. Um, so we have integers with max or integers with min. So grow and shrink only counters. Uh, PN counters are that you have two counters and then you like the current value is effectively the, um, the positive minus the negative or something like that. There's a notion of grow only sets, which are like the union based sets that we've been talking about up till now. Two phase sets are that you're allowed to put things into the set and then take things out, but you if you take something out, it trumps ever putting it in. 
Um, so you're basically using the joint, like the, the both the uh, um, the sets that we've got. And so we, 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 there's there's several different um, CRDTs that that pop up in practice. Um, and the nice thing about them is that they're all examples of a propagator network. And again, before we established that it didn't really matter the order in which you evaluate your propagator network. So there's nothing that stops you from distributing it over the network and then doing a bunch of local reductions on it and then sending the sort of edge propagator results across to other machines. Um, and then waiting for that to converge. Although you'll have all of the same problems that overlog and stuff like that had, which is that doing distributed data log, um, which again is an example of a propagator problem, uh, tends to have poor convergence properties. So overlog kind of yielded to uh, boom uh, later on. So. Um, all right. So, uh, so anyway, so, so to uh, Snyder's earlier question, um, where, what is this in literature? The closest thing that I can come up with in literature is the CRDT, uh, the CMRDTs, the, the commutative replicated data types, um, which at least ha like describe the messages as the actions. Here, what I'm saying is basically what I want is sort of the, the simplest thing that can possibly act um, to get me to, to where I am. So like what I'm doing is when a propagator, when I'm, whenever I'm asking a propagator to fire, it's because I gained some information. What I want to do is just like accumulate the gains in information, hopefully in some condensed representation. Um, and then when the propagator actually finally fires, I tell it to fire, but instead of giving it no information, I give it the actual gain in information since the last time um, this propagator network, this propagator fired. Okay, so that is the second life lessons that we took from data log. Whee! <clears throat> um, let's see how, how my throat holds up for trying to tackle something like... Um, well, let's, let's look at um, the par monad, which is not actually... There's, there's a project from Lindsay Cooper called Elvish. Let me pull this up. So in Lindsay Cooper's work, uh, she did a lot of space data structures for deterministic computation. This is the par monad. Um, and so like the first half of this stuff is all about um, values that hold on to join semi lattices. Um, and then the latter half of the paper is all about let's drop those requirements on the floor and work more like the commutative replicated data types stuff. Um, and so I like to think that the L and her Elvars or Elvish is actually Lindsay. Um, not not Lattice. Did I dump this? Yeah, I dumped it in the chat. Okay. Um, so in her world, what she has is you have the ability to create um, like let's call it like new Elvar or something like that. You have some semi-lattice of values, effectively. This is not quite the way she phrases it, but fine. Um, you can make an empty LVAR. Um, you can write to an LVAR. Um and you can read from an LVAR in a very limited fashion. And so the idea here is a bit more complicated. So reading from LVARs in order to yield deterministic results. Oh, and so the, uh, the main thing that the par monad lets you do is fork. 
you give me a par computation. And what I'll do is I'll just discard it, its result and run it in the background. But since what I can do is I can create LVARs, if I have the ability to read from them somehow, what I could do is I could read the final result that was going to be computed in this fork or something like that. Um, so I, I'm allowed to fork and read and write to LVARs and create new LVARs where the LVARs have some sort of join simulatus worth of information on them. Um, isomorphic. So what we're doing is we're talking about a, um, a general framework for doing uh, deterministic parallel computation. Um, right now we're more or less sort of establishing the formalism and then looking for um, ways to borrow results from other other problem domains. So the, the, the first problem was like how do you um, like uh, if I gained information about a value over here, how do I push that information around in a big network? And what we're doing, what I'm working on right now is a sort of, there's a, there's existing work from a, from a woman, uh, Lindsay Cooper, who, uh, did I say task-based parallel? Um, I don't actually care about the word task-based in the setting. Uh, I, I, deterministic is the, is the key, is the key to me. Um... What is wrong with gossip? Gossip is, uh, in the CRDT setting, gossip is generally the kind of thing that we're looking for. Uh, this is not necessarily for distributed computation. So um, most of the examples that I've given so far for things like data log and stuff like that are typically run inside of a machine. Um, so gossip is an example not the whole space. So what we did was we showed how data log fit into the framework that we've, we've established and then um, borrowed some of the, the, the things that made data log fast in order to phrase how we might be able to apply that to other, um, other problems in the space. Right now what we're doing is we're looking at some work on something called Elvish by Lindsay Cooper in the Haskell ecosystem. In Elvish, she has like a monad in which you can split out parallel computations and you can create these lattice-based variables and write to them, but reading from them is fairly restricted. Yes, data log is in the query language. Um, so here, like in her work on Elvish, um, the only queries you're allowed to make are um, let's see if I can do that. I'll have to switch to just the drawing view here. The kinds of queries that you're allowed to make require you to like, um, we need to introduce the notion of something called a filter. So a filter will be an upward closed set. So this would be a filter on this join semilattice. This would be another filter. Um, this would be another filter. I could take everything above this as well, right? So, um, what I'm interested in is this. If you gave me a set of disjoint filters where they only intersect at the top, of our join semilattice. Because remember, we've established that in our join semilattices, we always have this like kind of top contradiction node, which up until now I've said kind of will blow up the world, but I haven't really bothered to say what that means. So if um, if the only time, if you, have, if you have a bunch of disjoint filters that are disjoint other than the place at which I would blow up the world before you actually ever got there, um, <clears throat> then what they, they act like is they act like traps that if I get into that trap, then there's no way that I could have ever possibly gotten to another trap without blowing up the world. So we could have something like, um, I need a couple of sheets worth of blank paper here. Come on. Hey, I have it too. Um, so let's say we start with like um, pairs of Booleans. Let's say I wanted to compute the and of two Booleans in a join semi-lattice. 
So we can have bottom. And then I might have um, true and bottom, false and bottom, bottom and true, bottom and false. All of these things dominate bottom. And then we can have true and true. Uh, false and true. True and false. And false and false. Okay, so now what we have is this little funny joint semi lattice. And if I wanted to compute and of two things, uh, then like if I, if, if I wanted to compute the and of these two things, well then in this position, I know that the result is true. Here, if I know that I'm at least false in one argument, I know that the and is going to be false. Here, if I know that I'm at least false in one argument, I know that the result is false. Here, I don't know what I'm at yet. So everything above these two things will be false. So we have two upward closed sets. If they contain an element, they contain every element above them. And we, again, we, we have this contradiction node that's like way up above here. And so technically this true node contains the contradiction node as well. But we're never going to visit contradiction. This is one of the reasons why I don't bother to draw it. Um, so the moment we hit the contradiction, we blow up the whole world. You can do this like a propagator that propagates all the way out um, from the entire system. There's some kind of blow up the world node that we established that from every propagator network, there is an edge that says, if you reach contradiction in the input, then we, we write into the bottom to contradiction uh, indicator that the, the whole world is fucked. Um, and then we don't act actually look at any of the results. So um, what, we're, what I want to say is this. You're allowed to read from a LVAR as long as you only ever read with a um, set of upward closed sets, a set of filters, and then assign a value to each filter. So let's go look at our counter example earlier. Like when we had the counter, which was bottom, well, it was zero or one or two or three and we can max we can't ask the current value of the counter what we could do is we could ask um here is a uh, read that will ungate the moment the result is at least four um, we can't ask the contents of a set we can read from the set and ungate the moment one is in the set or two is in the set or three is in the set or when two and three are both together in the set. But that's the um, idea of the limitation of reading from LVARs is that you have to give me filters. I, I, I have a a window with actual code in it, but we've gone off into um, <coughs> into analog for a while. I am familiar with Minicanron. Um, there's a there's a lot of neat things there. Um, it's just re remarkably difficult to port to Haskell. It's one of the examples where um, schemes lack of types um, is almost a benefit. Um, <clears throat> so, so far so good. So we've, we've now established that Elvar, um, or Elvish is this little par monad. So one of the things is this, what we can do is when we got to write our propagators, we have to write them in something. And so it turns out like any function that I can write in Elvish is a monotone function. Um, and so it can only ever read from variables. And then when, um, when those reads would ungate, uh, then the, then subsequent computations can can have effects on other 
cells. So those can only cause me to gain information in the output cells. So as I gain information in my inputs, I can only gain information in the outputs. Um, and so it turns out like uh, every propagator that you can write in Elvish is a valid propagator, which is kind of nice. It's a language for a subset of them, uh, for a subset of valid propagators. But an example of something that you can't write in Elvish is that we can't write um, like this interval arithmetic uh, propagator network stuff. Where we, what we were talking about before was that my lattices looked like intervals where I, where I um, intersect intervals. And uh, because now what we have is that there is nothing that you can write that is a finite set of upward closed filters that will answer like just what is the interval of like the left hand side of an addition that is being added to the right hand side of an addition to produce the output result of an addition. I can't actually do addition on intervals in Elvish. Um, on the other hand, this example is also one that is somewhat bad in the sense that um, we had infinite height here. So if you wrote a propagator problem involving interval arithmetic, it doesn't necessarily terminate. And we can see that if we go back to the original uh, propagator paper, art of the propagator, I believe their first example is to like try and write something that like computes a square root like by iterative um, like these little heron steps of like like we can we can do a Newton Raphson improvement step of a square root and we were doing this say on the rationals this is going to keep improving and getting closer and closer to say you want to compute the square root of two it's going to keep improving forever. This will not terminate because the height of the network is unbounded and you're going to get closer and closer and closer rational approximations to two. So they have to start shoehorning in some kind of, is this thing good enough? And if so, then do a thing otherwise. So this doesn't fit into the notion of a propagator as I've defined it here. So the art of the propagator uh, paper builds a more general notion of a propagator, but then doesn't give it any loss. Um, so after I read Alexei's uh, thesis on the topic and the associated tech report, um, the first thing I really wanted to do was go add some rigor to it. And so, yes, I, as Marfic, I am talking about uh, assessment student. Uh, so Alexei Riddle is here uh, local in, in Boston, so I know I'm reasonably well. Um, so the, the Heron step here, he's setting up like building up a divider node and an adder node and stuff like that, where those those are what we talked about at the very beginning of the stream, which was that you can take an arbitrary um, Haskell function and lift it into a propagator uh, between these like simple promise-like nodes. Where in this case you want like the let's say you want to do an adder, how would you represent an adder? You want to add a and b to get c. Well, um, so our, we have our little, like, let's make a box or something like that for this. Um, this is like, again, a hypergraph where our edges can have multiple inputs. Um, what it, uh, I'll answer your question in a second, sorry. Um, what we might really want to have is this, is that the, the sum of A and B gets written into C, but also... If I know C and A, this is this works backwards, right? If I knew um, C and I subtracted B, I would get A. And I also have a subtraction node that says, like, if I knew C and I subtracted A from it, I'll get B. So there's like three propagators that should be running around here. Um, and all of these can work on intervals. Um, when we start t dealing with um, uh, uh, Interval arithmetic, this is not uh, going to yield necessarily the most defined propagator network, though. But for um, if we just have the very simple version, where like I know the value is exactly minus one, one, you know, zero, one, two, three, etc. Our earlier example with the integers, then we can do this this sort of propagation. Um, what are Haskell libs for building, manipulating, and traversing graphs? Um, so for traversing graphs, it's a bit of a mixed bag. There's FGL. I have a little graphs library, although mine's not really for manipulating them. It's so much as doing offline stuff. 
Um, I think uh, Ivan Ivan M. I've forgotten his the full spelling of his last name. Um, has a another graph library lying around. As for um, rasterizing to the screen, it depends on what you want to do. I have a GL library. There's also the more official OpenGL library for Haskell. There's Gloss. Um, if you just want to visualize stuff, Diagrams works really, really well. Uh, there's several options in this space. Um, widening for uh, widening abstract interpretation techniques. Um, abstract interpretation generally fits into this framework, I think, um, especially like a lot of the analysis for control flow analysis and whatnot. Um, yeah, we've been I've been off in. Uh, we've been kind of fiddling around with much more basic examples so far. Um, so let's see here. So this, in this case, what we have is we have three different propagators that all together kind of represent the relationship for addition. A plus B equals C. That's this adder here. And what we really want is that if we, um, similarly, if we do multiplication, A times B and get C, then um, we want to do some division whenever it's possible to come back and stuff like that, or yield contradictions. And again, we always have the option to blow up the world by yielding a contradictory result. So that's what this... Um, this heron step thing is, is building of the divider and the adder and putting a constant in there and blah, blah, blah. Um, so why did I want to use this example? I wanted to use this example as an example of a propagator network that doesn't yield a deterministic answer. It still computes. In this case, it makes progress. Um, but if you were to use this as a component of a larger propagator network, the evaluation order could matter about which things are getting refined first. So this was the first example that was in the propagator paper. The next example, I believe, was something about, um, oh, they started doing, talking about partial information and then provenance of information. And so here's where, I, another example where I kind of take, um, I, I get annoyed at the, not annoyed, it's perhaps strong phrasing. Um, where, where I think the approach in this paper is somewhat flawed in that what it does is it tries to track provenance information by saying, well, it's, what we'll do is we'll like basically blow out the product or we'll, we'll like give me a source, a set of sources of information. Like in this case, the example they use is to like try and measure the height of a building with a barometer. Um, and there's lots of different ways that you might try to measure the height of a building with a barometer. You could, um, you could measure the difference in pressure or whatever at the top of the building, which is going to be a horrible method. You could drop it off the side of the building and wait and measure how long it takes to hit the ground. Um, you could bribe the janitor with the barometer and ask for the blueprints to tell me the height of the building. You could measure the length of the shadow of the barometer relative to the length of the shadow of the building and then run down and then measure it in barometer lengths. Um, if you could do that fast enough to avoid the length of the shadow shifting in the day. Um, there's also, uh, oh yeah, that's right. Uh, Andrew Makov has this kind of gorgeous little um, algebraic structure for graphs, which was adorable. Um, I completely forgot about that. I don't know if it actually turned into a library or not. Um, uh, anyway, so here what we have is like, the idea there was like to represent my graph as like two to the space of all provenances yielding some uh, graph or some some lattice. So instead of having my original lattice L, what I have is I have um, two to the P Ls. Um, so wherever P is the like is the set of provenances that I might have. Like did I get that from measuring the height of the building by bribing by doing whatever because when you put those results together maybe the in aggregate they yield a contradiction but what you can do is you can say 
well, um, the height of the building get from bribing the janitor and from measuring it by the measuring shadows agreed. But if I dropped it off the side of the building, maybe I read my watch wrong or something like that. So we can try and figure out which sources of provenance agree and together yield tighter and tighter bounds. And Benjamin, the, the oh, it is it is unhackaged. Good. Um, I thought it was an incredibly gorgeous approach. Um, he presented it at ICFP. Was it last year? Maybe the year before. Um, and I really enjoyed the talk. Um, but the general problem here is that like this is too big for tracking provenance. Um, what we like we're we're moving into space bounds things that belong in time bounds we should do we should potentially do two to the p calculations of l but we don't necessarily need to do them all and hold them all at the same time so um there's more efficient ways to tackle provenance than this approach from like the old 70s lisp book that um sussman pulled this approach out of um and so in general, what I can do is like, if I have something that I want to like iterate several computations, remember we can, we can use par as a way to implement propagator networks, but we can also extend par with propagators as extra ways to push information between LVARs. So we can view them as like, they're, they're more symbiotic. You uh, like you use par computations to drive propagator network problems. Um, and so the par computation gives you the like linear end to end calculation that can do things like loop and figure out um, results and inspect the networks. And um, the propagators give you an extra way to push information around between um, join semi-lattices. Um, and to kind of tie this to something that's actually not in Lindsay's original stuff about propagators, this stuff can almost always be decomposed into simpler propagator network problems. Instead of trying to build this bigger join semi-lattice, um, it's generally, um, I find, more efficient to implement this as a bunch of little propagators. Because what's happening here is we're waking up on any change to this, even if it's a change that goes from, say, bottom to true and bottom. I'm waking up on a result that doesn't actually change my output. So I'm waking up too often. Like the propagator caused me to fire, which caused me to try and do some computation. Um, and I'm looking at the whole thing. Now here I only have two states, but if I had 50 or 500 little bits of pieces that I need to look at, um, this is gonna become much more inefficient, which we'll see when we start getting to like SAT solving. Um, so how could we do this more efficiently by using smaller propagators? What we do is we could say, instead of like viewing this as a propagator from the product of two things, what we do is say, um, I'm running out of paper. Oh, good. Um, uh, here, what we want to do is say, give me a simple propagator network here, and another simple propagator network here, or another uh, not network. These are just lattices. We have another, we have a join semi lattice that is their result. So, what you do is we can make a propagator that looks at this LVAR. Call it A. And if this is true, just writes into the true here. And if it's false, then we move on to the next step of this comp calculation, which is to block waiting on this guy. And if this is false, then we write a false here. And then what we do is we first also spawn another propagator that is blocked waiting on this guy alone. And if this is true, it writes true in here. So what we've done here is like we've built a little par computation. That does something like um, and which takes an LVAR bool. I'm just oversimplifying the terminology here just to make things simple. We get something like A and B 
Uh, you got to be these be I bars. Uh, so an I bar bool would basically be a thing that is bottom, or it's exactly something, or it's above that. So we'll first spin off a like. We'll just fork off a separate computation that first tries to, um, we can like make a read I bar that yields the actual answer because this just unblocks with the answer when it's finally known. Um, Part one does something like read I var A. If it's false, then read I var B. Oh, I need this is wrong. Right into C, false, true, right I bar, C, true. Well, we can just turn this into right I bar, C. In this case, if it's true, um, we, what do we need to do? We just need to, we're computing and, right? Did I, did I screw up and write false? or write or when I wrote this? I probably did. I wrote or. We're not gonna play around with par metal ninja. Um, so what he said, if uh, both of these are false, Oh, I guess if we're going to do and, then this is right Ivar um, C false. And if it's true, we write, um, we read Ivar B. And if it's true, we write Ivar B true. Part two is just blocking on this thing to see if it's reading from Ivar B. And if it's uh, false, we're writing into Ivar C false immediately. Yeah, here, every, every value will be a filter. There's also a, a trivial filter that we can put on bottom, but there's no interesting thing to do. That's why I built a separate read Ivar. We could Ivars work out really nicely. I don't have to come up with like a notation here for how do we talk about filters and stuff. Did I say right Ivar B true? Yeah, it should have been C true. This is less elegant than it could be. I didn't actually plan this example. Um here we got a false we could do the writing ourselves, um, but there's no point. So we could either just ignore this because we know it'll be caught by this part, or we could try and help it, or we could just be Fancy and do that. So this would be an example of building um, an AND connection between these two IVARs and this one. But we built it out of simpler parts. And so this ability to kind of build more complicated propagator networks out of simpler parts rather than build this 
um, complicated uh, product semi-lattice, I think is the thing that is missing generally from uh, Lindsay's stuff on Elvar's. Um, which is that, in general, I think that there's a relatively small vocabulary of sort of basic um, lattice components that we can build almost all of the interesting CRDTs that are out there out of. Um, and so if we can build this smaller, vocab this simpler base vocabulary for things that we want to say in the par monad, um, then we can build the more interesting connectives out of those things rather than building bigger um, semi-lattices. Because generally, if we, we wake up on a on a big semi-lattice of some sort, we're going to wake up for things that are irrelevant for the propagator. Uh, will I use this at work? Um, I'm not using this at my current employer. Um, this is a uh, framework that I was building uh, about a year and a half ago before I, I actually I, I got sick. I had a bunch of cancer problems and stuff like that. And so those are all resolved now. But it kind of lost me the, like by the time I got back to working on stuff, I was working on other things rather than this. So I haven't actually picked it back up since. Um, so this was, this was I, I guess, our first example of uh, building a more complicated um, uh, propagator network problem out of, out of simpler pieces. And I guess what you could do is you could fork this uh, so that we don't block indefinitely on part two. And then we keep going. So far so good. So we now have um, par. We've seen it as a decent building block. Um, the next step is to sort of view like how do we run a propagator problem that like, like our provenance one way to do that is to like make several copies of a propagator network. Like if I had a, if I have a like I don't know bottom or true or false. What I could do is I can make a whole other copy of this propagator network here. Where what we do is we kind of copy the structure. Like we'll call this one zero. We'll call this one one. We'll call this one two. But what this is is the lexicographical ordering of two. Uh, semi lattices. It's one of the, one of the many ways that we can stick them together. You can read the book by Davies and Priestley, and yes, I'm I'm doing quite well nowadays. I some there. Um, what we've done is we've found a way to glue together two different propagator networks. So if what I wanted to do was run a computation for one set of values and then transition to moving to the next set of values, what I could do is I could just kind of like view the product of like here's one and um, a promise of bool or something like that, or int with max and promise of bool. So we've built like the lexicographical product of two semi lattices. Here, this is not lexicographical. This is, um, they're ordered like together, like the vector product of, or whatever it is, just the general product of two joint semi lattices. This is a directed product, I don't remember which, I, I don't remember the phrasing. Um, so what I could do is I could use this in order to track the provenance stuff that we were talking about before. We were talking about 2 to the p. Instead of building a lattice that is 2 to the p separate L's, what I could do is I could keep track of the current provenance and then work more intelligently. So um, we were trying to build up a... Do I have another piece of pad of paper or something over here? I don't. We might actually have to wrap this relatively quickly because I just don't have enough uh, paper in order to scribble notes on. I bought some graph paper, but I don't know where I put it. Um, where was it going with this? Um, so we have two to the p copies of L if you're trying to track provenance the way that um, Riddle and Sussman do. If we instead iterate um, by just using the product of like what is the current provenance or something like that and L and then what I can do is um, uh, I can make a par computation that drives my propagator network to do the right thing okay um, so maybe we can do SAT 
I don't have any paper left here, but um, got a little bit of paper left. <laughs> so um, we built up a couple of propagator problems so far. We've, we've said um, data log gave us one life lesson about like something that was sufficient. We started with naive propagation. Let's go look at SAT and steal the things that made SAT solvers fast over the last 20, 25 years. Um, so we look at uh, DPLL and ZChaff and all this stuff. Uh, so ZChaff is a pretty old SAT solver. But it implements a couple of pieces. Um, one of them is something called unit propagation. Ah, maybe there's a hint that there's something involved there that, that we're using. Um, and another technique is conflict-directed clause learning. Um, and then it uses another thing called a two-watched literal scheme. And so we're going to try and see if we can steal each one of those things to make other propagator problems fast. Um, so the idea of a SAT problem is you usually put things into uh, conjunctive normal form where we have a bunch of clauses. I apologize if I get the terminology wrong. It's been a little while since I've worked on SAT. Um, where each one of the clauses is made up of a series of disjunctions of literals. And literals will be variables or negated variables. And I might have 500 of these in, a, in an individual clause. They could be ridiculously large. Um, you can reduce it down to three sat. You just need to use more variables. Um, and there's no point. Okay, and so in general, what we have is my current ap application state is usually viewed as like, what are the assignments I've made to variables? Like, is X just true? If so, then this thing has made this clause true. But if I had, say, a not X down here, that doesn't actually rule out this clause. It just means that this variable is not the thing that's going to make this clause true. Maybe I should go back to drawing mode. Okay, so it's, it's one of the other things that will make this clause true. And if I had um, y here on its own, because I say I had x here, or not x here, and I learned that this was not true, so now all of a sudden I have y on its own in a clause, this will tell me that y must be true. And so what I'll do is I will then propagate the information that y is true to all of the other clauses. So each one of the clauses could be viewed as a cell in um, my propagator problem. And unit propagation is the way that I push information around from cell to cell, telling me that once I know that Y is, uh, once I know that I have a single element, I'm going to learn that Y is true, and then this thing will propagate to all of the, all of the cells. So we could view this as we can build a cell per clause, we can build a cell per variable, which we say like x is bottom, or it's true, or it's false, or contradiction, you've told me it's both. And what we'll do is we will, when I have a single variable left, we will propagate into the, into the lattice for the individual variable and tell you its value. It's either true if, if the thing asserts positively, or if it's, it's false if it asserts negatively. And if you ever have a clause that has nothing in it, then we've achieved a contradiction. So we know that whatever the current set of variable assignments that we have here for all of our variables um, can't occur together. So what you can do is you can always take this set of variables and um, say this doesn't hold in aggregate. You can negate this and build a whole new clause. So that's conflict-directed clause learning. So um, the techniques that we have here so far are unit propagation, contradiction, and backtracking. And um, conflict-directed clause learning. And then what we do is we're going to run this. We're going to do unit propagation until we can't do unit propagation anymore. Um, if we ever encounter a contradiction, we blow up. Um, but then what we're going to need to do is um, 
when this whole thing runs out of steam, once we've kind of asserted the coherence of ever, all of the clauses with all the other clauses, now all we can do is start to guess. Um, so we'll just guess, pick a variable using some scheme that you want, pick a, like say, oh, Z occurred somewhere inside of here. I'll assert that Z is true. And then we'll do unit propagation until we've gained all the extra information that we can about that. And then guess again. This is how set solvers typically work. You tip, pick some nice variable, um, guess repeatedly. Whenever you guess your way into a corner, you learn a clause that says, well, actually that combination of guesses is incompatible. So you'll never commute into the same situation again later. You'll always sidestep the bad guess, even in more restricted situations. Um, so that's clause learning and unit propagation. The modeling of this is basically, I have like basically what, um, like just an iteration count as like the, I'll, I'll take the, we'll basically take the product of what loop, loop iteration are we on and the, uh, the lattices that we're dealing with over here in order to allow the par to sort of reset the system by moving to the next loop iteration. Um, and then there's one more technique which is really used, which is the thing that I want to steal. Um, and that's the notion of a two-watched literal scheme. And this was really the thing that made ZChaff, which was sort of the early, earliest like modern SAT solver, in my view, um, work. And that is, like, the problem here is, like, let's say I had 500 variables inside of this clause. And um, the moment any one of them changes, I am waking up and running through this entire clause looking to see if I am down to one literal left in order to unit propagation. And, but if you look at it, 498 out of 499 times that you wake up to look at this thing, because um, you're going to wake up and look at this thing like, you know, just under 500 times, because uh, it has 500 variables in it, um, you woke up and then you went right back to sleep. And so you didn't do any unit propagation. So you, your propagator fired saying, hey, look, I gained information about my inputs. Like, please tell me whether or not you're going to increase your information and then cause the output to um, propagator to, to fire. Um, it would be better if we could do less waking up. And the idea here is that we could say... Um, only All I want to do is watch for two variables. Pick two variables inside of this clause. Say that there's X and Z here. Where those two variables have not yet been assigned values in our current state. So you watch any two variables that have not been assigned to. And then only wake up when the two variables that I'm watching are written to. So I'll, I'll still remove it if like... Like I have a I have a set of like all of the occurrences positive and all the occurrences negative, and so like if you tell me that X is true or something like that, and you have X is actually true, so this clause can be just removed from consideration. I'll still do that. I'll just like I'll keep track of a current set of active clauses. Um, but let's say I had not X down here, and you told me that X was true. If or say you told me that Y is false or something like that, this would because it's not one of the two literals I'm watching in this clause. I don't care. Because we definitely can't be doing unit propagation because X and Z have not been assigned to. One, if one of those, if until you have assigned to X or Z, you absolutely cannot be propagating out of this clause. And then when you go to assign to X or Z, what we do is we wake up, we look at the rest of the things in the clause, and we keep going to see is there a second literal I could have been watching other than X. Let's say you assigned to X. Oh, we could, we could be watching W instead. Okay, then we'll watch that. If there isn't another such variable, then we are definitely down to one literal left, which is Z, and we're done. Um, so it, it's sort of a... There's always two variables you could be watching or you should have already unit propagated or contradicted by now. It's sort of, is sort of the idea of a two-watch literal scheme. And then the idea is that when you backtrack, you don't have to reset the variables you're watching is re backtracking is just removing variable assignments. And so if you were a valid to watch literal scheme before you backtracked, you're a valid to watch literal scheme after you've backtracked. And so the idea here is that you're doing less waking up and you are um, able to um, 
still compute the same result. Um, so you're doing less waking up and you're doing less work when you wake up. This is the idea of a two-watch literal scheme. So what do we need here? Um, we could generalize this to almost any propagator problem. Um, let's go back to our earlier examples of like addition. What do we have here? Right, like let's say we had just the like the simple lattices that like look like integers or something like that, um, but with bottom glued on the bottom, and contradiction glued on the top. Um, say we have this this um, network here. What we might do is like let's say I had a single addition node that was going to add up five hundred values and write out one result as their sum. What I could do is watch one of these literals, and then the moment um, until you have written to this value, like no matter what, as long as any one of the inputs is bottom, the output is bottom, right? So we have this sort of general result that f of bottom is bottom. Well, we recognize this. This is strictness. So if you have a strict propagator. You can use a one watched literal scheme. I'm going to watch a single literal, and until I've assigned to this literal, nothing will make the output non-bottom. So this propagator doesn't need to wake up on any one of these things changing. It only has to wake up when this one changes. And then what it'll do is it'll scan through all the others to make sure that none of those have been assigned, like that, like there, if, see if anybody else should be being watched. And if so, it'll go back to sleep watching this literal. And otherwise, it'll compute the result. So this notion of um, a one watch literal scheme to wake up a propagator is something that I'm now stealing from SAT. And in general, like before when we did addition, we kind of viewed addition as working as sort of like, if you told me any two of these three things, I'll tell you the, I'll tell you the third. Um, and so at that point in time, we could view a sort of like a propagator for addition or like exclusive or is nice because it's nicely, nicely homogeneous. Like if you change, if you tell me the output and all the other inputs, I'll tell you the, the last one. So you tell me 499 out of 500 things, and I'll tell you the 500th thing, no matter which one it is. Um, so now our little hypergraph now has multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Um, and only wakes up when 499 out of 500 of its inputs are determined. Um, well, it wakes up potentially a few times along the way, but it's at least making progress towards the goal whenever it does. Um, so strictness gave us like a one watch literal scheme, these sort of N way connectivity nodes where we've got adders or things that compute exclusive ors or subtractions on these IVARs also gave us a, a, a one watch literal scheme uh, or a two watch literal scheme. Um, or the directional adders or something like that. Like if we do products, like all of these things together can tell me the output. But if any one of these things was zero, for instance, then I wouldn't be able to use all of the results and the, all the inputs and the result to tell me the other values. Um, I don't necessarily wake up n times. I potentially wake up, um, the worst case, I still wake up n times. Um, you could you could propagate in the, in like, um, you could, you could always wake up exactly in the worst case order. Um, there, is a, there is an asymptotic improvement though, which is that if instead of doing a scan from left to right, if whenever I wake up, I do a scan only from this position forward through the list, then there's still an asymptotic improvement because I'll wake up and I'll go to bed further along in this list. And so I'll only do n, I'll only inspect n variables Whereas before, if I were to wake up naively and scan all n things, I was going like I could potentially have to wake up n times doing n work each time, and so it was previously n squared, and now it's n. So it is an asymptotic improvement. And you could view this as, um, in some sense, a um, generalization of the earlier schemes that we talked about from data log. Where you just kind of want to talk about the delta in some ways like the 
I know I'm at least this far along, and so I'm only going to continue to accumulate my position in a delta sense. So it's, you can view this as a very coarse version of that. But the other thing that we got out of data log was that unit propagation told us everything we needed to know about the answer. We were done with a propagator um, the moment we had, uh, or we were done with a clause the moment we had propagated out of it. Do I have any, I have one, one little page left. Uh, <laughs> Um, so we started out like with, with bottom and then we went to true and false because we were, why, why were we done? Because we were right below contradiction. Okay. So if you have a propagator that all of its inputs are right below the top of the lattice, you can't gain any more information without blowing up the world. So there's also a notion of like, if you were to watch all of your literals, to know whether or not you had um, reached like this maximal state, like because you could have again more a more complicated lattice where there's um, uh, several layers, but at the top, like when we had our um, our interval arithmetic, the very top level here was covered by contradiction. Right? If all of the inputs to your propagator are maximal, um, which means that uh, they're, they're, they're covered by top, we can say that x, I think this is the symbol y, implies there does not exist z such that x is less than z is less than y, where this is strictly less than. Um, so that, that like you know, I, there's no x is less x is less than y means that we should draw the edge of the host diagram. There's no node between them. Um, so using this notion, if we talk about everything, if if all of my inputs are covered by contradiction. If x, y, and z, then f of x, y, and z, um, if, if f is a propagator, then it will never propagate because it will blow up the world first. Um, <clears throat> so this gives another scheme for like using a uh, uh, one watch literal scheme to go to bed. So I watch all of my variables um, that have been woken up. Like once, once, once I have started evaluating the propagator, like I've, I've run, I used a one watch literal scheme but I may have only moved to like the bottom rung on like a several rung ladder. So I could still gain more information, um, which caused my propagator to continue to have to fire. So it's like, I can only use the one watch literal scheme to sort of wake up the propagator and then put it into full activation mode where then I may have to do more evaluation. Um, and then I can use a separate one watch literal scheme to put the propagator to bed. Um, by watching for when the propagators reach maximal position. And then I can know that no change in this variable will ever cause my propagator to fire again. So I can stop watching that propagator variable. I can kind of, or that, or that, um, that cell. So I can let that cell go. Um, so this is the idea of using the same one watch literal scheme. This is also a generalization of the scheme from SAT because if you look at SAT, every variable assignment took you from um, uh, there's no uh, no information to complete information, and I'm in a maximal. I have a maximal value where I'm covered by contradiction. So, there, like, like yeah, when you when you go to generalize the scheme from SAT, a it also it has a it splits into a sort of wake up and a put to bed state because now there's this intermediate window over which you have to evaluate the full propagator. Okay, so um, what we've gained is we've gained information that in some cases many. Uh, Many of the propagators I'm interested in tend to be strict, which is that if any of the inputs are bottom, I can use this uh, K watch literal schemes. So what do we do? We did life lessons from data log, sat life lessons, um, unit propagation is propagation. Um, directed products of lattices let us let 
par or something like it drive propagator problems. Um, what else did we gain? We gained um, uh, two watch literal schemes. Generalized notion of a K watch literal. And I'm showing the wrong screen, you're correct. Um, so sat life lessons, unit propagation is propagation, directed propaga uh, products of lattices, let us par, let par, or something like it, drive propagator problems, k-watch literal schemes, generalize strictness. Um, k-watched literals can wake up a propagator slowly so that I don't have it firing all the time until it's fully awake, a one watched literal scheme can put the beta propagator. Uh, and when we put the propagator to bed, we can actually remove it entirely from the network. So this becomes like this propagator contain, contains no extra information because we've We've climbed as high as we could without, with, and no, nothing that we do, can do further can cause this propagator to fire in a way. <clears throat> so this gives a form of garbage collection. So we've gained sat life lessons. Um, We gain some lessons from CRDT. We can distribute propagator networks over the network. Um, and even if we temporarily partition the network and stuff like that, the thing still works. Um, SAT gave us a bunch of neat tools. What other tools do we want to borrow from other domains? Um, finite domain solving. Let's, let's go there. Um, maybe I should take a quick break and grab another Diet Coke and do a couple things. Um, I'll be right back. Um, maybe two minutes, three minutes.
head. No sound on Twitch. That makes a lot more sense why everything went completely dead. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me now? All right, testing yep. one, two, three. All right, good. Um, switching over to, let me pull this out of the, or lost, uh, yeah, I lost the Twitch video because I dragged the wrong window over so I couldn't actually see the chat to see that nobody else could hear me. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> let's try this again. So the, the next algorithm I want to look at is something called AC3. And AC3 is a, um, an algorithm for quote unquote arc consistency in finite domain solving. So with uh, finite domain solving, what we're doing is we're, we're working with, um, say our values are integers or drawn from a small set. They're usually the kind of things that you see when you like, you have those examples of like Einstein lives next to Niels Bohr and so and so likes to drink like drink this kind of liquor and this guy likes to smoke palm oil cigarettes and so like those old bad 70s logic puzzles um and you know so and so's house is five doors to the left of so and so you know the other person's house um and you're trying to figure out like who lives in what houses and that kind of stuff um so this would be an example of a finite domain solving problem and one of the first things you want to do is rule out places that things could be assigned. So like you, you, you have a set of spaces where, you know, so-and-so could live. In this case, here we're saying, um, you know, the house X is in is to the left of the house, uh, is, some, is somewhere to the west of the house that Y is in or something. So we know that in this case, X started out as between one and nine, Y started out between one and nine, and um, after we learn the fact that x is less than y, we immediately know that y could not be 1 because there's no way for x to be smaller than that. And x could not be 9 because there's no way for y to be larger than that. So this, this would be our consistency. We're gaining information about the domains just from like adding this rule has already told us something even though we haven't made any assumptions about what x and y are. And then later on, if I learn that x is 3, like if, if, if I learn this is actually exactly 3, then I can immediately gain some more information about y being between 4 and 9. Um, and so we can do all the same things that we did before with propagation, where again, with sat, what we were doing was guess and check and then push some information around. Here we have to enumerate over more things. So we've now fit We didn't really learn any life lessons from finite domain solving. We just saw that it fit into the framework. Um, other kinds of um, things that fit into this general sort of network model, um, there's a notion of what's called a linear program, if people are familiar with linear programming. So here we have um, some kind of polyhedral region, like a series of linear constraints on a bunch of variables that are making cuts saying that, you know, um, it takes this much, this many parts to make a chair and this many parts to make a uh, table or something. And our cost is some linear function of those things that we're, put, we're, we're expending, minimize or maximize costs. <clears throat> uh, min maximize profit or minimize costs or whatever. Um, both of these kind of fit into linear programming or dual linear programming problems. Um, 
So in general, the solution will be at a vertex. Uh, this is like part of the origin of this like something called the simplex method, which is a way to crawl around these vertices, getting closer and closer to the answer. Um, there's interior point methods and stuff like that that are used to solve linear programming problems today. Um, and I totally realized that I am not showing you the screen that I thought I was showing you. I apologize. I am flaking out on you again. Why don't I use Linux for Haskell programming? Um, it's not a particularly deep bias against Linux so much as it is somewhat more convenient for me to be able to um, work on a Mac where everything else I want to do on my day-to-day -day existence just works. It just means I'm generally spending less time fighting with my environment. It's not, it's, like I said, it's not a deep set bias. Um, if Macs made shittier hardware, then I'd probably be running on Linux. But Apple hardware tends to just work. Um, <clears throat> so again, uh, basically what we're doing is we're crawling around our our vertices to get to our solution, or we're, we have some interior point methods that can walk through the interior of the space and find the critical vertex. So in general, like if I were to cut, if I were to make a bunch of a bunch of additional assertions that did not affect where the critical vertex was, that just like removed everything above this line here or something like that, then um, all we've done is kind of shrink the polyhedron in space and we haven't affected the problem, but we've potentially made it easier to solve. So we could view this as a lattice of intersections of regions that preserve a point. Uh, from a software perspective, I tend to prefer, I, I, I work on, on OS X mainly because uh, the desktop environment just works. It's, like I said, it's not a deeply held bias. Um, the uh, MacBook Pro stuff where they've taken over the, the touch bar has almost driven me completely away from Max. The deprecation of OS of OpenGL is driving me even further from Max. Um, the fact that I have to go through a shim in order to get Vulkan is suboptimal. Um, so Apple keeps making decisions that keep pushing me further and further from Max being my preferred development environment. But I bought this laptop a year or two ago, so. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, so a series of linear programming cuts that kind of preserve the critical vertex, like where the solution is this ver vertex. Intersections of those regions um, does not affect the problem. And so we can view linear programming as a valid propagator problem. But then there's a technique uh, for doing integer linear programming or mixed integer linear programming, where we use a linear programming solver as a component of the solver. So with integer linear programming, what we have is normally you just have a problem of saying minimizing, minimize this matrix applied to my, my solution subject to a bunch of linear constraints and a bunch of, uh, and we know that all of these variables are in like some positive half space or something like that, um, or some positive uh, quadrant. Um, with integer linear programming, some of these variables X are not just, um, they're not just real values, they could be required to be integers. So that would be mixed integer linear programming. Integer linear programming, they're all required. So um, what we would do for integer linear programming in order to try and build it out of linear programming, let's see if I can switch back to drawing mode here. I'll just go all the way to drawing. Is say we find a solution Um, let's say that we're kind of going in this general direction. We find a solution here, but this solution is not exactly an integer. Say X here is 2.5. So we've got X going this way and say Y going this way. So we found a value, we found a solution, which was the best solution for this polyhedron. Um, what we could do is we could construct two new bounds where here's like say the point where x equals two and here's the point where x equals 
three, rule out this space as infeasible. We know that the best solution we could ever possibly get is x is two, uh, is whatever the answer was at this line, because our answers get better in this direction. Then what we could do is we could investigate this region independently of this region. So we go through solve this region and it finds, say this is the best point. Then what we can do is we can extend that as a kind of cut, ruling out this whole region as infeasible, and then just explore this region to see if there's an integer solution, say here, that is better than the one we found. So we get like a branch and bound technique. Um, so the idea here was more that, um, like if we look at the cuts that I'm making here, this cut will preserve the best solution of an integer linear program, of a, of a mixed integer linear program. So this is a valid cut for me to apply to the state of my system. It like it intersects with my existing polyhedron in a way that only that leaves the, the, the critical vertex intact. So I'm only allowed to make moves that I know preserve the correct solution. If that makes sense, Boulder. So this is going to start driving um, a push generally in the, in the direction that Lindsay Cooper does with, El, uh, with Elvars. So she starts with um, a uh, join semi-lattice and then says you make a bunch of, you, you intersect with it a bunch of other, um, you, you make a, um, you intersect things from the same join semi-lattice. Um, you don't really need to have a join semi-lattice that you are intersecting with, a, you're, that you're, you're joining with a bunch of other uh, join semi-lattices. What you need is a join semi-lattice that acts on another join semi-lattice in an inflationary manner. Um, so what I'm saying here is really that these act as... Um, like Elvars or something like that, where I could I could ask the question about given a given a um, so this is more in the in the par framework than it is the um, propagator framework, and the reason I'm using this in the par framework is I want to establish that um, the intersection of a bunch of spaces gives me a solution that is like what is the best point that I want to ask. Uh, that, that is a question I could ask about it. So I have uh, the intersection of spaces gives me a smaller and smaller region. And then out of that, I could propagate an answer that is the, um, what is the best solution? Or what is the, you know, give me a, what is the score of the best solution? I'm sorry. Does it, did that answer your question, Bolu? I'm not sure if I if I did. All right, we'll take it off stream. So I apologize if I if I didn't address your your concern directly. Um, <clears throat> So the, the, the main goal here was to start saying that um, this that one of the nice things about this particular optimization technique is it is um, if I if I have say x is an integer and I know that it lies within one of these small intervals um, I can do mixed integer linear programming and also do finite domain solving on the same variables. Okay, so I can gain information from some kind of big set of planar cuts, know that I'm looking for X's that lie, you know, solutions that only lie on these particular bands, 
And then once I've got that, these things allow me to participate in the guessing schemes that I have from finite domain solving and what have you. Um, so I care about integer linear programming because pseudo Boolean solving comes up a lot for me. Um, and pseudo Boolean solving is like, let's solve a SAT problem, but assign costs to the SAT problems or the SAT solutions based on like the sets of variables you've given me. Um, and having a general framework for working with all of these things kind of at the same time is somewhat interesting to me. Like, I'm, I'm willing to give up an order of magnitude worth of performance in order to be able to have everything work in one framework. And in some ways, this feels a little bit like sort of the Z3 approach of here's a bunch of solvers for individual domains um, that are really, really good at little subdomains. Let's put them together and see what theories are sort of convex enough that we can just sort of enumerate over the, the intersection and then glue their solvers together individually. Um, and so that's, that's the general space that I've been looking at um, here with the propagator stuff. This was... Um, again, I last really touched this probably a couple years ago. And the major thing that I was looking at then was how do I make it so that I can do this as quickly as possible? Um, preferably in Haskell. Um, and within a machine, not across machines like at the CRDT domain. So the CRDT domain being across machines was sort of an, uh, uh, an extra that I discovered along the way. I wasn't really looking for that when I first started playing with it. Anyhow, um, I've kind of run out of steam here. So I think this is a good uh, break point for the stream today. I realized that I didn't make it to the four hours where I could hand off directly to Brian. Um, I think that's going to be happening less and less. Sorry, Brian. Um, it is a beautifully nice day out there, and it's very, very hot in this room under all these lights. Um, so... I think what we'll do is we'll wrap here and I am happy to talk to folks further on this stuff. Like if anybody has any questions, I'm almost always on uh, irc.freenode.net as Edward K. And there's the Haskell lens channel, which sort of functions as sort of an advanced Haskell channel. Uh, feel free to swing by at any point in time and ask questions. Um, and uh, that's it. If you've enjoyed the stream, feel, uh, if you have a uh, Twitch Prime or an Amazon Prime subscription, you can click the gift a sub button and it costs you nothing. Um, if not, that's okay too. Uh, you can still click the button. Uh, and I suppose I will try and see you guys next week. And that's all I have. So thank you very much for your time. And sorry we didn't get around to coding.